Good morning, everyone. Tarve tarve. Good morning. Welcome to our COFAS live webinar on the construction sector. We will talk about cracks in the foundation, construction under pressure. Uh, my name is Joran Ekman, and I'm working with the business information and risk management data here in the Nordics together with my colleague Lars. So our experts today will be Jonathan, our economist, Henrik, our senior risk underwriter, and finally Lars, who will talk about uh, their different areas, our insights, and hopefully we can share some, some good knowledge with you today. Uh, the format of the day is they will speak for approximately 30 minutes, and then you might have a lot of questions during the seminar, and we will... <clears throat> gather all of them together and i will ask them to the experts at the end if you have any other questions uh just please email us as well if, if you, we, you want us to get back to you so uh, can you change the slide Fabian? how do you ask the questions there you see the question panel that will show up and i will summarize them like i said and ask them at the end of the presentation we are also recording this and we will share it to you uh, in a couple of days. So a very warm welcome to you all. And without further ado, I will hand over to our first Super Dane of the day, Jonathan. Thank you for the introduction, Jorn. Um, I will, I'll try to be, be quick here. It's something I'm, I'm rarely good at. Uh, but basically, what we'll start with today is is a quick overview of the of the global macro scene. What are some of our top risks as we see them right now? What is the current situation in different avenues of this? And then we'll sort of focus in on the construction sector afterwards. Um, I will go through some of these slides uh, slightly quickly, but again, uh, you'd be able to 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 get them upon request uh, afterwards. Um, so to start off. Um, in in COFAS, in the uh, Economic Research Department, we four times or well, three times a year, used to be four, uh, would do these updates on the business defaulting risk in roughly 160 countries across the world. So I want to highlight this is a business defaulting risk. You may have seen a similar map from somewhere like Moody's and Fitch, but what they usually focus on is sovereign risk. And being a credit insurer, what we care about is the business defaulting risk, non-payment, as that is what's interesting to us. And as you can see in the latest one that we changed back in back in February, we didn't see a lot of changes, especially not closer to home. Uh, we saw five five changes, and and Europe and and North America didn't see anyone in the last one after having seen quite a few downgrades uh, during last year after the invasion of Ukraine. Um, the next one will be uh, next month. Um, in which we'll sort of have reviewed everything and updated uh, accordingly to how we perceive the current risk environment. So why is the map looking as it is? Well, overall, we, we believe that the next year will be defined by stagflation in advanced economies. Now, what does that mean? That means we are generally speaking in a low growth and high inflation environment. So that means while inflation will come down, it is still quite high from a historical point of view. And as you can see, sort of global growth will slow down. And compared to previous years, as you see on the left hand side, what will be driving the growth will be almost exclusively emerging economies in China, whereas advanced economies will contribute very little. And if you look on the right hand side, you can see why that is. Most countries find themselves within the plus one to minus one spectrum with, with a few outliers. So it's the US, Spain and Norway here standing out for three very different reasons. And in the other end of the spectrum, we have the UK, Finland and Sweden seeing, seeing falls in, in, in GDP in 2023. Due to slightly different, but also some similar reasons that is uh, falling real income, high interest rates, global trade sort of slowing down. So different countries are affected at different speeds, but more or less advanced economies, we are expected to stay in this stagflation environment in 2023, which means that the growth potential the, the, this year won't be that good and inflation will be slightly more persistent than I think many people were hoping. 
So where do we see the, the global list? I made a checklist here and sort of named five different ones that have been discussed quite a bit in the last few years. Supply chain issues, energy crisis, inflation, rising interest rates, and the banking crisis. Now I will uh, I will quickly go, go through each of these and hopefully afterwards you have a feeling for where you see the different ones afterwards. If we start by, by supply chain issues, this was something that really was defining 2021 and 2022. Um, as while well, it might seem like a long time ago now, in 2021 we were already talking about inflation, and this was driven by supply chain issues. Many people were having a difficult recalibrating after lockdowns, with global supply chains being quite disrupted. And this gave a lot of issues in the fact that supply just couldn't reach demand, and we saw this generating a lot of inflationary pressure. And this was just exacerbated after the invasion in, in Ukraine. But as you can see, after inflation picked up even further, and this had effect on global demand, so what our expectation was for how much the world would grow this year and next year, we saw this easing. Basically, less demand meant that this mismatch sort of got more in line. And as you can see on, on the right-hand side, we are seeing suppliers delivery times now actually starting to improve a bit in the start of 2023 after a long period of, of deterioration. However, we are not there yet across the board. This is a global supply chain pressures, so there are differences between regions, between countries, between sectors. And as an example, if we look at the Danish construction sector, when they were asked in the recent survey uh, how many people saw uh, supply chain issues still being a somewhat or large um, uh, interruption of their day-to-day -day business, it went from 50% last year to still being around 20% now. So while the supply chain issues have eased, they, they are still there um, in the Nordic countries with, with an example here. The next one that I wanted to mention was, was the energy uh, crisis. And uh, I do think there is some good news here. Thanks to, uh, among other things, a, a warmer winter, we are in a quite good situation in which e the uh, European um, gas storage is quite close to its historic maximum capacity. We didn't use as much in the first uh, few months of 2023, and we've already started building up capacity. And that means that the fear we had last winter of there literally being a gas shortage, we did not have enough energy, is not our central scenario at this point. We do believe we'll be able to build up the, the capacity to withstand another winter. Um, but with that being said, there are still some risks here. A, a, a another very, very cold winter could be quite difficult for us. A worsening of the political relationship with Russia we do still import some energy from them, could actually also hurt us quite a bit. And ironically, a bigger upturn in the global economy would increase demand, and that would actually once again pressure us on it. So while our main assumption is that we do have enough en energy to sustain the, the next year, there are some risks there. And they'll have an effect on, on, on energy prices as well. So while we have seen energy prices, uh, especially natural gas, coming down from these very high levels last year, it, it, it should be highlighted that these are still quite high in a historic uh, perspective. If we go back to the pre-COVID years, it is still about twice as high as it is. And while this has been slowing down, we, we do believe that we'll see a bit of an uptick towards the end of the year as demand starts coming up again there. And something similar will happen to, to crude oil in which we've already seen OPEC countries uh, indicating that they believe the, the, the price level is a bit too low at the moment, so they are planning to cut down production. Um, so energy prices will, will likely sort of increase a bit, even if, if we are in a situation which um, actual shortages is not uh, something we are as worried about as we were last year. So a thing I think you've all heard about a few times is inflation. And I'm sorry to bring it up once again. Uh, but as already mentioned, inflation did turn out to be slightly more persistent than many people were hoping. And as you can see on the left hand side here, while we do expect it to be going down uh, in 2023, it is still quite above the 2% target that most central banks have. 
Some countries will see it being very persistent. That's somewhere like Sweden, uh, in which it will stay quite sticky. As you already know, the latest figures were still in double digits for the inflation rate. Finland will see a somewhat decrease, and, Sw and Denmark is here, the one they'll see the lowest rate, but that is still above 4.5% on an analyzed level. So we are quite above the 2%. And this has a real impact on, on people. Because if you look on the right-hand side, I here added the real wage growth that we saw last year. And this came after two years of roughly unchanged levels, maybe increasing by 1%. In Norway, which was the best case, you saw a fall of 2%. And Sweden, which was the worst case, you saw a fall of more than 6% in your real wage. And if you look at the left-hand side and think in your back of your mind, what is the collective agreements going on in my country? What are the unions saying? I think you'll notice that for a lot of people, they will see a second year of real wage fall this year again. Some people will say it's stabilized. Some people who maybe have very, very, very good negotiation opportunity will see a slight increase, but many people will see the real wage fall for a second year in a row. And that will start infecting people. We've already seen retail sales going down and people will have to start rethinking their consumption habits. One of the things that has uh, changed a lot over the last few years is the current interest rate environment. I think most of us have gotten used to uh, quite low interest rates. At least if you have a mortgage, this has been a very nice situation. And that has changed after being very fond of the word transitory, central banks sort of picked up speed and started hiking. And this time, I think I'll start on the right hand side because we are occasionally hearing people say that the hiking cycle is over and we're going into a cutting cycle. And I feel like the right hand side here really shows that we are seeing more hikes than we are seeing cuts. We are not in a cutting cycle yet. So while it has slowed down, there are still more hikes than there are cuts. Now, what will that mean to us? If we look at the left-hand side, we, we do believe that the Fed did their last hike of this year. Doesn't mean any cuts are coming. We do believe they will maintain the rate for the rest of the year. But in Europe, we still have a few hikes to come. Uh, we expect the ECB to at least do one more hike, probably 25 basis point, potentially even a, another one. And we do believe the, uh, the Scandinavian central banks will more or less follow one-to-one -to, -one to, to, to play it safe. We could potentially see the Swedish Riksbank being slightly more hawkish, as you probably noticed. They raised 50 basis points when the rest raised 25 at the last meeting. But with the current financial turmoil, uh, maybe they will choose to play it safe instead, even if inflation is, is slightly more persistent. And that leads us very nicely into the next topic, which is the banking crisis. Because central banks are very much right now weighing financial turmoil and fighting inflation and both of these are very very important for them so how do they find that good balance in which they tighten enough to weaken demand but not break anything on the way and the crisis in our opinion has changed form while we went from initially what i'd call a liquidity uh, crisis in which there were all these dep deposit runs, which meant that we were afraid that banks would collapse due to them not having enough liquidity. We saw central banks very quickly stepping up and filling out this gap. And as you can see, in many regions, the credit default swaps, that's the left-hand side, the chance of, of, of default, it's roughly back to the same level as they were at the beginning of the year. So European banks and Asian banks are roughly perceived to be as risky as they were before. American banks are still seeing a bit of a premium, especially after First Republic. And another one which is seeing quite a big increase is, is Nordic banks. And that is to a large degree down to uh, exposure to the real estate sector, which is something I'll get into in a second, which has put down this premium. It should be mentioned that the Nordic banks is, is a selection of quite a few banks, as you can see in the bottom. So. Where are we going next if this first state of the banking crisis is over? Well, we're going into what we'd say is a potential liquidity crisis and a credit crisis. So what does that mean? It means you go from banks being quite worried about the liquidity situation, realigning their asset liability balance and suddenly realizing, oh, maybe we need to be slightly more lenient in regards to how much credit we, we give out. And they'll start uh, hardening their credit standards or taking higher premiums 
for, for their loans because they perceive it to be slightly more risky. So that is what we believe is the next state, a potential credit crunch. So where are we then in this checklist of global risks? Well, supply chain issues, we will say, have, have improved from, from last year. The energy crisis is looking better. Uh, while inflation is coming down, it is proving more sticky. So I think saying that one is improving is, is maybe a little optimistic. But rising interest rates and a banking crisis are still very, very high on the list. And these are the things we need to be quite worried about and keep a, a close eye to. And what does that mean for the construction sector? Well, overall, we do believe there's a weakened momentum here. We are seeing a high interest rate environment that will only hide more. We are seeing lower demand driven by different factors. High interest rate is one of them. Lower real income is another one. And housing affordability is something we already were discussing before COVID. Then we saw a massive increase in housing prices. And now we're seeing an increase in interest rates, which means this pre-existing problem of housing affordability, especially for new buyers to get into the market, is already there and is worsening. That's a difficult situation, especially when you're on top of that at tightening credit conditions, which means that higher interest rates will be there, making it even more expensive, and we will have stricter credit standards, which means they will actually lend to fewer people as well. Now, I, I promised uh, my wife to always be slightly positive. Um, so I will say while our outlook for, for the residential and commercial sectors is not that positive, um, we do see a lot of opportunity in the infrastructure. So uh, if you operate with partners who are very active in that space, we do see a lot of activity here, um, which will ma maintain a certain amount of, of, of demand in, in the next few years. And that'll both be true in the, in the US and in Europe. So that there is some, some opportunities here. Now, what do these headlines mean for our risk perception of construction? On top of the, the 160 countries we do um, country risk assessments for, we also do sector risk assessments for just short of 30 countries. And these are across the world. And uh, as you can see, in the construction sector, we generally speaking find it in a high risk to very high risk environment. And if we look closer to home, most, most places in, in Europe, uh, both Western and Central Eastern, are in a high-risk environment with a, a few of them being in a very high risk. Uh, one of them is the United Kingdom, where I'm so lucky to sit, and, and Poland is another one where we do see the, the, the risk environment to be slightly higher than, than just high risk. Um, so where is the current state of the inflationary pressures? Because as we, as we all heard, supply chains are going down. And as many of you probably know, we have seen some improvements in commodity prices after these really, really peaked. They have been coming down. So are construction prices going down as well? Well, we've kind of seen a transformation, which is initially we saw these raw commodities increasing in price quite quickly. But this is coming, this is coming down, but that is not really translating into the construction cost index prices, as you see on the right hand side. And why is that? It's due to a few different reasons. One of them is the simple fact that while raw commodities are falling in price, the processing of them, such as um, wood mills or smelting companies, are still faced with quite high energy cost, which means they have sort of a lower bar on how much they can sell it for, for still being profitable. On top of that, while you may see a fall in your real wage, you are still paying maybe around 4 to 8% more to, to your employees, which will have an effect on your costs. And lastly, as already said, interest rates will obviously raise your financial costs as well, which is why, as you can see, despite the fact that we are seeing a fall in many commodities, the construction cost indexes continue to rise even as we go into 2023. And this is having an effect on production on, as well. If you look here on the left-hand side, we saw a bit of a fall during 2020 in building permits. We saw a very quick recovery in, in Sweden, who really decided to just get those permits going. But roughly speaking, when 2020 Q1 was over, so after the invasion, we saw permits going down basically across the board. 
Actually, in, in, in Finland, it started coming down a little earlier. And if you look on the right hand side, now that's activity in the construction sector. We see that, that Finland, with a certain lag, so towards the end of 2022, started seeing their activity going down as well. So a bit of a lag from the building permits, but it was coming down. We see that in Denmark as well, with production capacity also uh, coming down in the beginning of 2023. And while we have not seen that yet in Sweden and Norway, most indications do seem to be that we are coming down now with quite simply high cost and less demand. And speaking of that demand, I've, I've already mentioned this a few times, but just to put that into perspective, we are here seeing sort of average mortgage rates for, for households. And those are increasing quickly by a factor of two or three some places. And it should be added, the one I have here only includes um, February or March figures for the different countries. So that means that the latest increase, just due to policy rates, they'll add about 50 basis points to Sweden. And this is also before Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, which will add this premium on top of that. I don't think you have to be an economist to guess which direction this mortgage rate is going in the next few months. It, it's going upwards for all of them, which means that everyone who needs to remortgage or get into the market right now is faced with a lot of costs. And we can see that in consumer confidence as well. So this on the right hand side is a simple question, which is how do you see the current environment to make a major purchase over the next 12 months? So this is forward looking. And a major purchase is things like a new house, uh, maybe redoing your house or buying a new car. And as you can see, this has been coming down very, very quickly, especially after the invasion and after uh, in the beginning of 2023, we were in a negative environment, which was a lot worse than it was even during COVID. And we are seeing some improvements in Denmark, but for the other countries, it is true that this is, continues to be in a very, very negative environment, which means that the outlook for the next 12 months will be that consumers are in a situation where they're saying either we don't want to or we can't make any of these better, big, big purchases for a better car, better house, whatever that could be. And this is also supported in in the banking sector. So I said earlier that this went from a liquidity to a potential credit crisis. And as we can see here, this was actually already happening to start with. Banks were already before the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank starting to tighten their credit standards because they could see that the outlook for 2023 with high inflation was a difficult one. And this will only worsen from now on. This is currently for households. If you look at the picture for, for corporates, it's a very similar one. It's tightenings for several quarters in a row now. And we have the first one from the ECB for the newest one. And that is already saying that we saw another period of, of tightening here. And that especially comes down to banks quite simply saying they're not as optimistic about the, the current situation as, as they were. And if we look on the right hand side, this is a bit of a, a technical graph, but more or less the intuition is when changes in bank lending happen, where do investors usually see the biggest change in where they're buying equities? So how do investors perceive different sectors when banking standards change? And as you can see in the bottom of this, we have real estate, which makes a lot of sense given that credit is needed on the buying and the building side, which means that when credit shrinks, the value and the perspective on the real estate sector deteriorates very quickly. So it, it's quite a different and difficult way, way to operate for real estate and construction companies for the time being. And we can see this in, in, in profitability as well, which started going down after the invasion, after costs started increasing. Uh, that's the left-hand side here. We see it on an aggregated level. And debt after coming down following COVID is starting coming up again, which is, is a sign that, that generally speaking, you need to take on more debt to do the business. And while we did see a, a slight improvement in, in net profits in, in Q1, I will say this, this should be taken with a caveat that the market is, is going one way and it's not necessarily upwards. Um, as you can see um, on the right hand side, we're also breaking this down by, by countries and it is true across the board that we are more or less seeing sort of falls um, across with a slight uptick 
in, in, in Sweden, also in Finland, but that is again from, from, from quite a low level. Now, what does that all mean for something that we uh, care quite a bit about in COFAS, which is corporate insolvencies? Now, I've, I've made a, a quite simple little equation here, which is uh, ending support measures, whether that's pandemic or energy crisis. It is the change in your cash position as your cost increase. It is for many countries, uh, for many, many companies, a higher indebtedness than before as well as bank tightening their standards. And lastly, a weakened de demand due to higher interest rate and falling real income. Now, what does that mean? It means that insolvencies will go up. And we are seeing this across the board. On the left-hand side here, you basically see the corporate insolvencies within construction sector. I also have a similar graph for related sectors, that is real estate or manufacturing that goes into construction. And the picture is, is very, very similar. We are seeing quite a strong increase compared to last year. That's the, the black bar here, which is over 30% in every country except for Denmark. And I can put a little caveat on Denmark there. And if you look on the right-hand side, after we did see a sort of lower level in 2020 and 2021, which is government support, furlough schemes, loans, they started coming up. And now across every country, we're seeing that we are above the pre-pandemic level. So this is not just an increase from a low level, it's an actual increase. And I said the little caveat uh, about Denmark, and, and that is the fact that while this is a lower fall from last year, it's because Denmark saw a bit of a quicker increase in last year, but something actually also changed there. So after COVID, we did see a bit of a change in the composition of which companies goes insolvent. And by the composition, I very much means the size of the companies. So these were either very small companies or what we in Danish call an inactive company, which means there's actually not really any business in it, which then went insolvent. So we saw this wave of small or inactive companies initially going insolvent. And what we're seeing now is the average size of the companies that go insolvent is increasing as well. And the same is true for the uh, other Nordic countries as well. So we saw an initial wave of smaller companies, but be, be, because that the general environment is worsening now across the board, we also start to see larger companies getting into issues as well. And this is a trend that I think, uh, once again, to, to say uh, you don't have to be an economist to see which trend that, that is going. Um, so I, I think I might have spoke, spoken a little longer than I was supposed to. So I will leave uh, this on to, to, to Henrik to, uh, to continue a hopefully optimistic part of this. Yes. Uh, Jonathan, if you have control of the presentation, could you uh, switch to the next slide? Thank you. Yes, this is just a, a quick slide showing uh, that uh, how much COFAS has of exposure in the construction sector. We have a global construction sector exposure of 73 billion euros. And uh, if we take it to Northern Europe, that is Germany, Netherlands and the Nordics, we have uh, approximately 19 billion euros in exposure uh, in this area. As you can see on the, on the right hand graph, we have seen uh, a trend, a sharp increase in non-payments, breach of contracts in all sectors, but uh, special, special, especially in the construction sector, followed by the macroeconomic changes as uh, Jonathan has just presented. History has uh, shown us that the construction sector is the sector that first gets impacted by a negative trend in the economy. It's a lead indicator. And the Nordic construction sector had had some very good years in 2020 and 2021, showing strong economical development and, and booming order books. But that has uh, changed now. If you could just switch to the next one, Jonathan, thank you. Great. That brings us to a uh, challenge in the construction, construction sector. Uh, the challenge is, as many of you know, not a product of a single change, but a product of several succeeding events, going back to our rapid responses to aim of the spread and of COVID. And before that, uh, even, even that, a booming, a booming trend going the right way. We have seen several supply chain issues uh, origin by, by COVID and the following reduction of production of many construction materials all over the world, which has resulted in uh, bottlenecks. The lack of certain materials 
mixed with a record high employment rate for construction workers had created a shortage of qualified manpower. And to make matters worse, uh, the cost of uh, both materials and manpower has increased rapidly over the last couple of years. The shortage of materials has uh, resulted in changes to planning of projects, resulting in a lot of postponements of original plans and timeframes. Also, um, the sector, construction sector, has been using fixed price contracts or contracts without really putting a, a worth, worthwhile mentioning of indexing for many years, as this has not been necessary. But as the price for materials has increased rapidly, many contractors have been hit very hard. The problem with fixed prices has also affected suppliers and end users because when the price goes up, well, somebody still has to pick up the bill and, and pay for it. We have also seen a, a rapid upward spiraling interest rate. That really means that many business cases, larger construction projects or even private household projects are less profitable than they were when they were signed or agreed upon. This has, can force the beneficiary, the investor or the end user to uh, either alter their original plans and to downsize in, uh, in size or in, uh, in quality. We have also learned that many several, uh, that several larger projects as well as housing for private residence users has been cancelled uh, before they started as the calculations simply didn't make sense if the projects were started or, or, or tried to, to be completed. All changes to uh, projects already in the process or the cancellations of projects from the, from the backlog requires that the management and project leaders are very experienced and can adapt very quickly to the SWIFT in environment. This has not always been possible. And here it is also important to remember that the market has been growing significantly for some years now. When a market is growing, we often see that investors, builders, etc., try to get a piece of that action. This may result in the stakeholders moving outside of their comfort zone and accepting more risk. For example, agreeing to enter larger projects than they have done before or switch to other geographical areas. You can call it over-optimistic to, to gain a profit. Then when the market changes, conditions changes as rapidly as they have in the last two years, this again calls for experienced management and project leaders. In a market where the trend is negative, management also has to make some very hard decisions and choose if they will reduce staff uh, or even perhaps agree to enter less profitable, perhaps even non-profitable projects in order to keep their builders occupied and wait for, for better times. When most of the stakeholders in, this, in the construction sector has challenges of some kind, the risk of uh, misunderstandings, substandard construction work that increases. And at the same time, conflict willingness is, is higher. This results in extra hours, extra work, delays, disputes. And uh, this, of course, then again, results in uh, payments being withheld, liquidity squeeze, and unfortunately, default for, for several contractors already. The number of defaults in the construction sector has uh, seen a rapid increase since the start of 2022. Looking into the bankruptcy, we can see some clear patterns and, uh, and learnings. We in COFAS has tried to identify these uh, similarities uh, with other companies within the sector uh, and, and tried to compare them. Based on these uh, learnings, a vast number of the Nordic buyers in the construction sector has been approached by us uh, as we have tried to get updated and updated financial information and also just information on how are they doing with their with their current backlog with them and with their projects. This is the we have a close to the risk focus in, uh, in Kofas. So in, in Denmark we have focused only on the on the Danish buyers. And this uh, has meant we have had this large interaction between local information providers, uh, uh, our policyholders, and also our buyers. Uh, and the all of a sum of all this has uh, provided us with valuable information to fully understand, and or at least be better to understand, and provide the best possible insight 
to for us to steer and mitigate the risk for for all of our policies and and for and for COFAS. Well, that was a uh, very brief and perhaps more down to earth explanation of what we have done in in, in Denmark in the construction sector. So I will leave the mic to to Lars for for him to take over. Uh, thank you, Henrik. Uh, let me just turn on my webcam here, my uh, my microphone. I hope everybody can can hear me and see me. And then I'm just going to find the correct screen here. Um, I don't know. Is my presentation up and running now? Yeah, looks fine. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that we are sort of uh, running a little bit tight on time also, so I'm going to try and keep this very short and I'm going to skip some, some slides and some steps in, in my presentation um, and, and cut it down to size. Uh, but I think afterwards, if uh, Joran, if you could then showcase the contact slide again, because then I would suggest that if anybody is sort of interested in hearing more about sort of how we how we productize uh, the information that you have just heard from, from Jonathan and from Henrik, uh, the projects that we build, how we can assess uh, clients or suppliers, uh, how we can set up a, um, a risk data information service for, for you guys, if you're interested, then, then please give us your name and your emails. Uh, and, and Jordan and I will reach out to you uh, as soon as we can, and we will set up a one-on-one -on -one, uh, Teams meetings or come by physically um, to have a chat with you. It uh, shouldn't take more than, than 15, maximum 30 minutes uh, of your time if you're interested. Um, but let's um, just give me notice when I run out of time, uh, Joran. Um, just, just, just to continue with Jonathan and Henrik sort of, sort of um, ended their presentation because what, what they have been talking about is sort of the sum of all that we're doing in COFAS because we assess companies because we're taking risk ourselves. Um, and as Jonathan started out, that everything starts out in a broad funnel, uh, so to speak. So we start out on a global scale. We start out from macroeconomic perspectives and elements. We then size it down or scope it down to be even more precise every time and getting closer, closer to the one on one company that we are talking about or that is your client or your supplier. So normally this is uh, this is scoped as a funnel, but in today's, uh, as we're talking construction now, I try to build it as a house instead. Um, but what sort of makes us unique or the data and information that we have unique is, first of all, we are the only global trade credit insurance company that has chosen to sort of open up the, data, the insurance database with all the insurance information that we have uh, to provide to you as data points. Um, and, and this gives a unique insight. It gives the same insight as we manage and run our own risk with uh, when we insure uh, your clients. Um, and it gives us a unique opportunity to gain an information that is more updated than what you normally would see if you only look um, at a client through a traditional credit report, for example. So we try to move perspective from a sort of historical perspective, what have happened last year or the year before, to actually what is happening right now. Uh, this might be last month, this might be last quarter, this might be, if we're lucky, what happened last week. Um, but what you see in our, in our sort of data, if you look at the house on the right side here, um, you have what I call baseline data or master data also, um, marked in green at the bottom of the house. That is sort of the pure foundation that everything is built on. Um, but when we go into taking risk ourselves, we need to add on even more layers and we need to add on more insight. So what we do is, first of all, as Jonathan has mentioned, we, we, we start on the, on the, global, uh, on the global level, it's looking at the global macroeconomic perspectives. Then we sort of scope it down to a sectorial, to regional, to a country level, and then again from there to a sectorial um, view before going down and sort of attacking the precise company that you're looking into. And this is where, for example, Henrik comes in as an underwriter. Um, but 
all the elements that comes in, the underwriting experience, the experience from the analyst that we have that, that conducts all the interviews, that, that gather all the information to the data handlers that process this information, validates it um, and, and inputs it into the database, this is what makes us unique. And as you see right now on the screen, actually right now we're covering more than 670 billion euros um, in, in total on a global scale right now. So we need good and precise information. We need updated information. Otherwise, we would lose money. Um, so, and that's also sort of a good quality check on our information is that if we do make mistakes, we would know that it will cost us money to do so because we have clients insured for the very same sort of for the very same amounts that we that we predict or that we use um, in the data. Um, and everything that this whole sum of information um, that has been gathered is sort of being cooked down to two core products, uh, which is our scoring, the debit to risk assessment score, and of course our sort of credit opinions, which states sort of the score states, okay, what is the status of the company? What is our view on this company 12 months ahead? Uh, and this scoring is of course directly linked to the probability of default which Jonathan also mentioned is the, is the probability of default for the business default for the non-payment. Uh, and then we combine this, of course, with the credit opinion saying that we would like to guide you also in saying how much credit would it be possible for you to manage or to actually give this potential client um, of yours um, in, in our view and in our experience and with the data that we have and the knowledge of this client. So that is sort of the very, very sort of simple setup that we have. And these, what you see here, the, the, the scoring and the credit opinions, that's sort of our Coca-Cola recipe. Uh, everything is sort of secret behind. Uh, now you saw some of the elements that are inputted, but this is the very sort of simple outcome that we come forward to. The scoring is a simple one to 10 scoring. Uh, and the credit opinion uh, is sort of supposed to give the impression of if you ask for insurance on this client, how much would we insure, for example. This information is not only sort of Nordic based or uh, in, in the four Nordic countries, this is a global operation where we cover more than 200 company or countries in the world. We have more than 50 data centers around the world set up to gather, to handle, to sort and validate um, all of the data that runs through the, the COFAS uh, ecosystem, if we can put it like this. Um, we have at this point, and this is a funny number because we have more than 200 million companies in our insurance database. Um, and compared to others that say, well, they have 500 million or 600 million companies in the databases, then this is the 200 million companies that we have that is only insurance data. And this is actually companies where we have an active exposure or we just had an active exposure or that we have a request for an exposure towards the company. So, so this is companies that where we have um, real time and high valued uh, data uh, on these. And as mentioned, we, uh, we cover right now, we have a total exposure on global uh, scale of six, more than 670 billion euros that is managed by the very same data that I talked about here, the DRA. Um, and we have more than 800 experts around the world, just as Jonathan, Hendrik, and all the analysts and the, um, the guys that validate data around the world. So it's a massive operation. It's massive amounts of data that runs through. And it is a high valued uh, operation because if we didn't have this, the setup that we have, we would probably go bankrupt quite soon if we uh, if we didn't um, give our utmost to this. Um, just again, very short regarding the DRA score. It's a simple 10 scale score, 10 being the utmost best quality that we can assess a company. Uh, zero is a defaulted company. And the scoring is directly linked to the probability of default. And this is also sort of based on some of the more complex projects that we do. Uh, if we help by IFS 9, expected credit loss calculations, and so on. Uh, but the scoring itself as a simple value is a unique, easy to use tool to manage either suppliers or debitors. Um, and of course, then combined with our credit opinions, then you are really set for a good game, evaluating your risk, but also finding your potentials in your portfolio, 
or managing again your suppliers um yeah we do also use dashboards uh, alongside of um, our solutions and our products where we sort of add on again we put it up in a global dashboard you can highlight your risk if you're global uh, exposed you will get your risk per country per sector you would actually get and this is also here where we do for example the ifs9 the expected credit loss calculation you can either use our calculations or you can actually just use it as support data if you want to um, and in the dashboard again we actually link companies with holding companies and so forth so you get an even deeper insight into your into your exposures into your risk um, and so on but and then again just to sum it all up quite quite rapidly is that it is basically one unique data source it is two if we make it quite simple, as simple as we do, we make it very simple. It's two elements of data. It is the DRA score combined with the credit opinions, sort of to guide you on your way. And the projects that we do, which you see on the screen here, is sort of starting from supply chain on the left side, moving towards internal processes, uh, financial operations, to sort of a sales and debitor risk management uh, in what we can aid you with um and and this is all sort of gathered through either the two platforms we have we have a icon which is a standalone platform we have the covenant platform which is where we can combine the data part with the credit insurance and um, everything or both platforms uh, or data are completely um, um uh, fully scoped for API possibilities so it can be fully integrated into your either ERP, CRM system or sort of a cube if you have a centralized data hub internally uh, within the organization so we can make it it can be quite easy it can be centralized data and it can be complex but we can also make it very simple for you guys uh, I'm not going to use time. I talked a little bit about the probability of default regarding the DRAs. Um, but I think I'm just going to jump to the thank you page. Um, I went 10 minutes over time. Uh, but as I mentioned, if you're interested, please reach out and give us your name and number or email address. We will uh, reach out to you. Um, the presentations will come out afterwards uh, with contact information for all participants in, uh, in the webinar here, and uh, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, I would also like to say thank you to everybody who showed up today, uh, to our experts, and uh, please let us know if we need to change anything for next time, the format. I know we ran over time a little bit, but just please reach out uh, before or we will reach out to you. So thank you so much for joining today and have a great day in the sunny weather outside. Thank you.